In the photography world, if you see an amazing new product, and there's a lot of amazing new products, you almost always know that the person behind it is an actual photographer, which is why today I've got the CEO and founder of Platypod on. This is Behind the Shot. Hi, welcome once again to Behind the Shot, the podcast where we try and get inside the mind of great photographers by taking a closer look behind one of their shots from conception to completion and all the stories and challenges that happen in between. I'm Steve Brazel. It's nice for you to join me today. A couple things I want to touch on before we get into some housekeeping stuff, before we get to my guest today. First of all, back on the episode from December 6th with uh, Carl Eric Voslog, I started a contest in conjunction with Red River Paper. Carl is a student at Santa Monica College's photography program, and Carl Eric, and he's got this beautiful photo that we discussed a seaside in Norway on that episode, and you've got a shot to win a print of that, a 13 by 19 print from Red River Paper, and we're also doing 10 sample packs of Red River Paper. I've actually been using the paper. I got a couple of prints right here, and so far, I really, really like the paper. You got to make sure that you check them out. I've got all the info on screen for them right now, so you can go check it out, but here's the thing. If you want to get in on the contest, go to behind the shot.tv at the very top it says contests click the link for red river paper and you'll find all the info you need on how you enter to win one of those sample packs or possibly even get that print also make sure you check that episode out too because it's a wonderful episode which brings us to today's episode it's an honor to have this guy on i think larry you were introduced to me by rick salmon a mutual friend of ours and he he messaged me about your product platypod which i i do want to get into And I'm going to be honest with you, I had not heard of your product at the time. Uh, You obviously are a a genius, in my opinion, at this point. So let's talk about you for a little bit. First of all, you are a portrait travel, macro travel photographer. How long have you been doing photography? I'm happy to say over 45 years since I was a teenager. So you, okay. And so 45 years, you definitely started with film. (laughs) What was yes, what was your first camera and what made you what got you hooked on photography? Well, I was a 15 year old and I was just interested in in getting my ideas, my thoughts onto print. And I couldn't paint for anything, um, but I knew what I wanted to see on the paper. And I just started reading everything I could. I read the old magazines. I don't know if people remember Peterson's photography and oh, yeah. uh, photo magazine and photography. And um, I learned everything I could do about it. And I made a deal with my dad, who was an uh, importer who was going to the Far East. And we decided, I remember trying to decide, should I get a knicker mat or should I get a Konica? And those were like two really popular beginner's cameras in the days. I went for the can. I went for the Konica, much to my dismay, because I would have had a nice Which one? Do you remember? It was a Konica T3. Okay. I still have it, and I use it to teach children how to do photography. I open it up and I show them, you know, what does shutter speed mean? And you can't learn shutter speed better than to actually see the shutter right. opening and closing. But anyway, that was my first camera, and I got hooked. I did my own black and white. Um, printing. I, we had a walk-in closet in our apartment on the west side. So of Manhattan. you developed your own black and white film? Oh, yeah. Okay. Oh, in yeah. a closet, in a walk-in closet. In, in a walk-in closet. Okay. I, I, I put, brought in all the stinky trays of chemicals and laid them out on a storage chest and uh, had my red light going on there. But, yeah, this, I, but this was not, I, even then, did you know that this was not going to be a career per se, right? I mean, you got serious. You went to, I, I read up on you. Uh, you went to a Nikon school seminar. You took a master darkroom class. You were serious. Oh, yeah. But did you yeah. know that you weren't going to be a quote unquote photographer for a living? Absolutely. I decided when I was seven years old that I wanted to be a doctor. And that was my that was my uh, goal of what I wanted to do professionally. But that doesn't mean you can't have fun. And uh, for, for me, photography was an expression and it was just plain fun. Everything from the gadgetry to the composition of the photos, to the printing of the photos myself. And to this day, I, I print my own See, my own and, photos. and I want to touch on, photo- on being a pediatrician here in a second, but you're the second uh, doctor. My dentist is also a very, very radically serious photographer. 
true. And I look back at my life and I just can't help but think, because I'm a geek by heart, I'm a network engineer by trade. If I had understood when I was a kid, that's why what you said about opening the camera and showing kids really strikes a chord with me. If I had known when I was a kid what geekery there is behind photography, I would have gotten into it at three. <laughs> oh, if you like toys, hey, there's a lot of toys to play with here. Very definitely. So you are a practicing pediatrician. Yes, uh, and in fact, you practice yourself. You have six kids with your wife, Mina. Correct. Uh, and you had an office. Where is it? New Jersey? East Brunswick, New Jersey. Sure. Okay. We have a busy of, practice. Of a five person practice. And here's what I love. You use your office hallways and your 10 exam rooms as your gallery. That's correct. I've got a, between, I think, 40 and 50 full size uh, you know, pictures, 16 by 20 or larger uh, pictures just posted in the different rooms, different themes. It helps me, by the way, we have 10 exam rooms and it helps me know which room I'm in by looking at the themes. Of you the theme pictures. the pictures? I, I do. So we have some, you know, some nature landscape. Um, we've got uh, some flower close up pictures in another room, uh, Acadia National Park in another room. I was just there. Isn't it amazing? I was just in Acadia National Park in Maine, Bar Harbor, Maine. Uh, we went to see Vermont. We'd never been in northern New England. And I have to say, wow. It's Acadia is amazing. Oh, it's just a beautiful. So you're a Nikon shooter. You shoot a D800. And if I'm not mistaken, you shoot Tamron glass, correct? I do both. I do. Uh, my my favorite lenses are I have a Nikon 14 to 24, which is an unbelievable lens. The contrast, the sharpness on that lens is uh, almost unparalleled. Uh, and I also have a Nik an older Nikon uh, 70 to 200 uh, VR2 lens. Not the N, it's the generation before that. Uh, but I also do a lot of Tamron glass. I have to say my, my uh, 24 to 70 is a Tamron. I just bought a 35 millimeter Tamron uh, SP lens. And oh my God, that is one also one of the sharpest wide angle lenses. I use that now for, for family portraiture. Uh, amazing. amazing. I need to try them. I've, I've got a Sigma. I have a Sigma 15 millimeter that I like, 2.8. I need to try some Tamron glass. So let's get into, since we're talking gear. I need to touch on before we get into your photo, and I promise to the viewers, uh, I have an audio version and a video version of this show, and to the viewers, I will get into the photo, I promise, but I need to touch on Platypod because I had not seen a Platypod when Rick Salmon said, oh, you need to connect with my buddy Larry. Okay. And I had heard of it, <clears throat> and I had a lot of questions in my head. And I'd heard of it from Rick, and I'd heard of it from Photo Joseph, and I'd seen Hildmar Smith, who's been on the show, uh, in fact, all these people have been on the show. Scott Kelby mentioned it. And then, right about the time Rick told me about you, Scott Kelby posted one of the first behind-the-scenes shots. He was in a you know church or something in Europe where you would never set up a tripod. And he right. took a phone shot of his camera on a Platypod Ultra. I think it was an Ultra. It might have been a Max. <clears throat> and I went, wait a minute. <laughs> what the heck? That's genius. So... <laughs> There's two of them sitting next to me, along with the accessory kit here, both sizes. And I, I, I've got to say, well, let, let's start here. Tell me the story of Platypod. How did you end up creating Platypod? As a preface, you know, I'm, I, I, I have to say I'm no genius. And this concept is nothing genius. The only big question is why didn't anybody do this before but isn't that kind of the genius of it that no one thought of it and and when i saw it that's that's the thing i had when i first saw this i literally it was one of those you know palm to the forehead moments of how did nobody VA. get this so how did you so, make this thing what made you make this thing very simple very simple you know i've been shooting for a long long time and i have gone through so many mini tripods trying to get the system working out the problem for me was always that a small tripod either didn't hold the weight. And, okay. you know, look, we use heavy DSLRs, heavy lenses, didn't hold the weight, or it just took up too much space in my camera bag. And because, you know, hey, you could do a lot of things just with a bean bag, but you need a sizable one to be able to set a little bit of angulation on it. Um, so th the story goes, that's the preface. The story goes that my wife and I went on a a trip to the west and we went to, to Bryce Canyon. We hiked a thousand feet down and a thousand feet up, dragging along 
my uh, travel tripod, a Van Frodo tripod. It was a great tripod, but you know what? Going up a thousand feet, and I'm not as young as I used to be, um, it Aren't was hard. All? It was very, very hard in the heat and all that to do that. I got home. I said, look, there's got to be a solution to this problem. I, st- I went over to my friends in B&H, and I, and I was looking all through. There were about 250 compact tripods. I wanted a flat one that I could slip into my camera bag that would take up almost no space. I could put in a little tiny ball head in there and have an ARCA compatible tripod that I could go anywhere with. Cause there's always somewhere to put, to put a, a small tripod onto a rock or a boulder or a fence or something. So anyhow, right. nobody made it. So one night I wake up at two o'clock in the morning. I actually could, could show you, I took out a piece of graph paper and I started sketching out this little square thing. And I said, square, that looks a little bit too dull. Hey, why don't I round it at the tip? Hey, that looks kind of like a duck bill. That kind of looks like a platypus duck bill. I got a great idea. You came up with the name the moment you created it? I'm a pediatrician. Platy means flat in Greek. (laughs) A pod is a foot. It's a flat foot. Right. And it's reminiscent of a platypus. So... Basically, what we did is we took a plate of aircraft grade aluminum. We punched through a bolt, which originally was going to be stainless steel. Oh, there's a cute story about that. And we figured we could make this, you know, fairly inexpensive, reasonable, and market it, market it to the public. I have a friend and neighbor who's in the metals business it's from a company called Amtech International. And I got together with him. He said, okay, Larry, you got this crazy. He doesn't really know photography. Got this crazy idea. I'll humor you. I'll help you produce it. Let's see. We'll see where it goes. He figured it was probably going to die. And the, the part with the stainless steel is when they went ahead to anodize the plate, because we wanted this thing locked in so you didn't need any tools in it. When they went, they, so they first um, soldered through the, um, the bolt into the plate, and then they went to anodize it. The stainless steel all melted in the anodizing oh. solution. And when we did our research afterwards, we found out stainless steel will never survive anodizing solution. If you look at any product that's anodized, there is no stainless steel bolt built okay. into it. But what do they use to dip the uh, the plates into the solution? They use titanium hooks. So we said, we'll make the bolt out of titanium. We did that. It all worked out great. And we had the platypod and this thing was super strong because the bolt wasn't just welded to the plate. It was punched through, countersunk, and then soldered in place so you can't dislodge it. And we found we could hold hundreds of pounds off axis with this thing. Well, so you could basically put any any tripod head on it. And and what I find fascinating about it, the, the first time I held one, it was, it was this weird kind of, and, Okay, so let me describe it this way. It's a surface-mounted tripod, right? Um, The first time I held one, it was this weird kind of moment of, and this is why I I used that word I did, this genius, simple design. And and I thought, well, but it's flat, and you've got to now balance it, so what do they do? They include these screws that you can screw through to hook it and hang it on a rock, or level it, or balance it, or drive it into something. Um, no tools required. This is all done by hand. I sound like a commercial now and honest, this is not a commercial. Okay. It's not my intention, but, uh, you've got two of them. You've got the max and you've got the ultra, and then you've got the, the accessory kit and you've got new stuff in the pipeline coming up for 2019. You've privately told me about, and what you're holding right there is which model. This is the Platypod Max. Uh, well, we we originally had an old one. You can't get this one anymore. This was our original Platypod. It's the duck bill. Okay. And this one had two bolts in it. I had a, um, a 3 8 inch 16 and a quarter 20, which are gotcha. the two okay. international sizes of, of bolts. Um, after a year of listening to customer wishes on this, uh, we decided to come out with a larger model, one that did a few more things than this. We had to ditch this bolt because there were a lot of tripod heads that were knocking into it that wouldn't go on. Well, and I actually like that the bolt on the current models is, is you know, offset to the rear because that helps balance correct. the lens. That's correct. Plus, 
it's got this is really starting to sound like a commercial. I apologize, but this it's it's I'm serious. When you hold it, you'll understand. I was telling a friend of mine I was interviewing you today and they had not heard of it. I'm like, okay, here's the link. Uh they've got slots in the plates for right. straps. You know whose idea that was? You know my friend Levi Sim? I, I have met Levi. I don't know him well, but I've met him. Always with a hat and a bow tie. That's how you know him at a con for, at a convention. But uh, Levi is uh, somewhat of a hiker and a hunter. And he said, I want slots in there so I can just take off my belt. Whoops, lost my metaphor. Take off my belt and just strap it right through and strap it onto a tree if I want to do some remote work or do uh, some nice. time lapse. Uh, long long exposures we put those and then and those. the screws i talked about that you screw through are actually inside that little correct so we built a little holder for these screws it comes right off if you don't want it there and the screws are held in magnetically and now these screws are only necessary maybe 10 percent of the time but oh, if you're but on rock you or concrete them. if you're on rock and co or concrete then you need these to prevent slipping and so we've got a nice sharp tip in here and then so that there's no jiggle, there's a little round nut in there that tightens it in. So it is not going See, anywhere. See, that's what I'm talking about. These things are so well thought out and engineered. Very nice product. Uh, I got to say, man, you did really, really good. You might have to give up the doctrine. <laughs> Well, no, that's that that's that's still that's still uh, what I what I am, what I do. But that's OK. Um, but you know what? I find it takes a photographer to understand photographer's needs. And I just kept saying, what would I want to use? And I listened to our clientele as far as right. what they want. If right. somebody said to me, I'd like to be able to mount this on my tripod. OK, so the old one didn't have this. I put a little 3 8 inch over here. So you could actually put this and store it on your tripod. And now when you want to do low angle, instead of flipping your center column upside right. down and spreading the leg, you just spin this right off, put it on the ground. Well, and if you've only got one ball head, you don't have to move your ball head around. The That's ball correct. head stays on the platypod or goes on the That's tripod. Correct. And if you that want the plat, correct. you know, if you want it off the tripod again, you just take it off. It's <clears throat> really well thought out. So let's get into your shot here sure. because you are a photographer and you're quite a good and accomplished photographer. It's exactly. it's interesting to me that you don't do this for a living because some of your product photography, uh, as I was looking through your gallery and and your gallery, I'm going to just bring it up here really quick over you. Uh, you are you don't have, quote unquote, a portfolio in the sense of your own website at Dr. right? You're right. over at what service? I'm at the Smug Mug, uh, just very easy to use, and it uploads right out of Lightroom. So I, I chose it for the ease of use. OK. And now that, you know, Smug Mug on Flipper, Flickr 2, which I'm really looking forward to. So as I'm looking through your photos, <clears throat> I saw this photo and it immediately jumped at me. And there's a couple of reasons. So as I bring the shot up, let's talk about this a little bit. It's sure. a product shot, kind of a body side of a beautiful guitar. What was your exposure on this shot? Let's get the technical stuff out first. Um, well, so that I could sync with the flash, it was one two hundredth uh, of a second. I think I can go up to one two fiftieth. But sometimes with studio flash, if you push the envelope too much, you may get a dark band uh, at the bottom of your photo. So, uh, so I did that at uh, one two hundredth of a second, and I shot the uh, the image at f twenty nine using a sixty millimeter Nikon macro uh, lens. Um, the reason for F29 is I wanted sharpness throughout that picture. The subject was the guitar. The subject wasn't a knob or a string or something like that. So since the subject was the guitar, I needed the entire guitar to right. be. And with a macro lens, the depth of field is going to be so, so and, and as close as you probably yeah. were on this. Correct. It's going to be so tight. Way. And you Correct. do all the way through the bridge. And the pickups, you've got focus on this with a, a macro lens. You shot this with, oh, what was your ISO? ISO I kept at the minimum uh, at, at, F, at uh, M1, uh, ISO 100. Um, there's something people don't understand about, about ISO, ISO or ISO, uh, some people would say. Uh, and that is, it doesn't just give you greater, uh, greater brightness, more, more light. What it gives you is greater dynamic range too, and less grain. P 
people don't understand that concept of a, a dynamic range well. And if you want to understand dynamic range, a book I highly recommend everybody should read. Ansel Adams, Ansel Adams. The Negative. And in this book, he discusses the zone system, the nine the nine zone zone system going from stark white with no detail to absolute black with no detail and how photography, how, how photographs should encompass these zones and, and use them. But the zones explain dynamic range and with good dynamic range, you want to see detail in the dark, in, in the dark areas and detail in your highlights, details in the shadows, details in the highlights. Um, a, a low ISO gives you greater dynamic range, more stops uh, that you won't achieve once you go higher. Okay, so, and and let me get this out there too while I'm thinking about it. I know that you shot this with, I, I think I looked it up in the Exif data, or you sent me a screenshot of it, that's right, a D200, right? Yes, yes. Okay, so first question comes to mind is, do you play guitar? I don't. It's my son's guitar. Okay. Um, it's actually not a very expensive guitar. It's a an old Carlo Rebelli uh, semi-acoustic that he picked up at Sam Ash, and he learned how to play guitar. And uh, the son of mine, Arie, is very, very good. In fact, uh, he had a jam session a few months ago with Rick Salmon. Oh. And, you know, Rick is quite an accomplished guitarist yeah. himself. And my son was teaching him chord project, chord uh, Sorry about that. Chord progressions uh, in the lesson, and he had a great time with them. Were you using a tripod or a platypod for this shot, or was this handheld? This was this was on a tripod. This was already years before the platypod uh, okay. existed or anything like it. Um, but yeah, I you you know what? <clears throat> People go, oh, I can handheld this, and I can handhold that, and yes, you can, and you can put it up on Instagram, and it's going to look fine. But when you want to blow something up to a 16 by 20 or greater, you want every bit of rock stability that you can get. So, you know, when when sharpness is critical, you want some type of a tripod support. Yeah, exactly. And here's the things in the EXIF data that made me wonder. It shows you were on <clears throat> manual white balance. So you manually set the white balance for this. Correct. Smart you know what I use for that. But it also shows that your metering was matrix. Did you ignore the metering and you just did it to your own taste or were you watching the metering and why weren't you in a spot metering? I, I, I don't, I didn't use the camera meter at all. I'm okay. using studio, studio strobe flash and to regulate the exposure, I use a Sekonic flash meter, which automatically fires off the studio strobe and I set my I set my strobes and my exposure by that by that meter. I'm able to actually dial in the exposure at the flash. I have about six stops uh, plus or okay. minus on. Uh, Makes on sense. The so focus point wise, single focus point. You want yes, yeah, single focus point. You want to focus about a third of the way into the image. So and, where uh, would you do? Do you have any recollection where your focus point might have been? I would shot. have chosen. I would have chosen uh, about a third of the way in one of the lower strings uh, to to focus on, and that would give me that would give me the uh, maximum depth of field from beginning to end. Because you, usually your your focus point should be about a third of the way uh, into the uh, as though the, you're shooting a landscape. Really, I mean, correct. And then you play around. You play around with your f stop until you see that you've got the full depth of field. You, so you do some test shots until you see that you've got the full depth of field. So here's the thing. Here's what makes this shot to me. I mean, the number of things that make this shot to me. Because again, product photography is not an easy thing for a number of reasons that you get right in this shot. First of all, you chose the right angle, right? You can see each individual string. There's a there's space between, have you, had you gone lower, they would have touched each other. Had you gone higher, it just would not have had the depth impact. So you're Correct. at literally the perfect angle for this, but I also see the golden spiral in this shot. So when you're when you're cropping, there's different overlays that you can do. There's the rule of thirds, there's the golden spiral, and a bunch of other compositional overlays that you can either use in your head or in software. I see the golden spiral in this. When you were shooting this, what was in your head that that got you? 
Do you understand what I mean? What what it's, what were you thinking that got you to this angle? Not not only angle high to low, but most people would have lined up with the pickups. The fact that you went to the left of the pickups and left of the knobs gave you the back of the pickups, which again increased depth. You made right choices here. Steve, it's it's about the elements of design. And I've actually I've studied design by reading, you know, reading books, and it's line, form, texture, color. And and these are the things that you want to bring you want to bring out. By the way, I didn't just go up and snap this picture. I spent about two hours <laughs> with that guitar and and playing with playing with the light and playing with the angles. There were two things I wanted to bring out. First of all, I if you look through a lot of my pictures, I love using I love using uh, diagonals because diagonals imply imply motion and and action and uh, dynamics. Plus. I wanted to throw something else into this picture, and that is something to let your eye wind through the picture. And so we we use the curve of the camera, of the curve of the uh, guitar at the bottom to wind your eye through. And it was quite a trick to get the lighter stripe there going all the way through the picture. And that took that took a lot of work with lighting angles. Well, okay, so let's touch on lighting here a little bit, <clears throat> sure. because one of the hard parts of any product, the, the, in, in my opinion, where most product photographs fail is people light them incorrectly and they blow highlights. So you have specular highlights are fine and everything, but you can't blow highlights on parts of the product that matter. If you're shooting a watch, you can't blow out the the watch face, right? right. Um, you, you have to control that. So was this one light? This was one light. Okay. And uh, one light very, very carefully placed. And let me, let me explain this. The, the, the reason I, <clears throat> I got into this was actually after reading a book. Can I hold up another book? Yeah, hold up anything okay. that you want. Anybody who's interested in product photography must read this book. It is Light, Science, and Magic by, I'm sorry to say, the late Phil Hunter, F-I-L Hunter. Okay. And I guess you'll have this in your show notes. Um, it's now in its fifth edition. This is used uh, in many uh, colleges uh, as a textbook for, uh, for photography. But what it does is it takes you through different materials such as wood, plastic, metal, glass, mirrored surfaces, and how to light them. Think about this. You want to light a metal spatula. If you don't right. light it correctly, you're going to see black on the spatula. And if you light it too much, you'll just see white on the spatula because that mirrored surface is only going to show you what it's mirroring. So essentially what you're doing is what you're looking at off of the spatula is either a white card behind it carefully placed so that you have maybe some dark elements or you could use some kind of a gobo or shape in it. Right. Or it's gonna show you the, uh, the soft box itself. <clears throat> that you're lighting it with. When I'm lighting this guitar, because the guitar is has a lacquered surface, it has the properties of shiny plastic. Okay. And to be able to bring out details in the lighter portions, you have to have some of the light coming back at you, but not direct reflections back at you, or you're going to be seeing a mirrored image of, of the light. However, if you look at the side of the guitar, which is nearly black, you must be looking at a mirror of the soft box or you're not going to see anything. So because this undulates in and out, you're getting varied shapes within that dark section, but those are all reflections of the soft box. And, and you controlled with your light position and understanding all of that, you Correct. controlled your speculars so, I mean, Correct. I see one on the bridge, but that's that's metal, right? Correct. Most people would have had it on the the nut around the toggle for the pickups. Most of them would have had it all over that bridge. I can see detail. I can see wear in that bridge. Wonderful lighting, which then takes us to what you do afterwards. So for post what software do you use you're a lightroom user you said because you uh, use smug well i do well in, in those days, i think this was done with uh with just with photoshop okay this is, yeah. 
Uh, right now, though, you're a Lightroom user. I'm a Lightroom user, and I, I start with Lightroom, and then I move into Photoshop for final retouching. If I have to do, if I have to do any significant retouching, then it goes in Photoshop. Do you so, use in Lightroom? Are you one of the guys that starts with a plugin and then embellishes it? Do you, or or a preset? Do you do everything, every slider no, from Light, scratch? Lightroom, I use I use basically just for uh, for asset management, uh, rating my pictures, choosing the the one the keepers. Uh, then I go into the develop module and I go through whatever slider is necessary to get that picture uh, looking right. And it's very important to use a calibrated monitor uh, yes. to make sure that you are you know getting it looking looking correct. Uh, then I take it into Photoshop where I'll do where I'll do, you know, the clone stamping or healing brush, whatever necessary there. And in Photoshop, I will sometimes use some plugins. Sometimes I'll use Luminar. Sometimes I'll use Nick software, which has been brought back from the dead. Well, <laughs> and actually, and I just saw in a forum somewhere where people were saying, oh, my Nick's not working. Should And now they want more money. DxO bought Nick, and I got to say, I was having major, I love Nick, uh, right. and I was having major problems with it until DxO basically rewrote it from scratch, and to me, it's still a great investment. Correct. I mean, their, their pro contrast filter is unequaled by anything else in the industry. When you want to when you wanna bring up yep. uh, the shadows a little bit and not have it look artificial, that pro contrast filter is unbelievable. In the old days, we used to do something called lab LAB processing, mm -hmm. uh, where you would put something into lab mode and then you could play around with it from there. This is just one slider and you get it. Well, and what and it's funny, you're the only other person who's ever mentioned the one filter I love. I will dial an image in and love it. <laughs> and then I'll go, you know, before let's I post see. it, let's just see. <laughs> And That's I take it into Photoshop and I'll pull it up in 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 uh, Color Effects Pro is where Pro Contrast right. is, and I'll do Pro Contrast, and suddenly realize, man, was I wrong? That image had way more it could go. Plus, it's got a color correction slider in it, uh, as opposed to the contrast only. Right. Um, I love that filter. Uh, and one good tip, just in general, you know, for for your for your viewers to know, is that when you want to make an adjustment on something. Just like you you just stated, push that slider past the limit. Yeah. Where it looks bad. Oh yeah. And come back to where it just looks nice and that's where you belong. Okay. Yeah, that's true. Uh you're all you'll always it's it's like for the golfers out there, you never want your ball to stop before the hole. If you're gonna miss, you still want it to go a little past the hole. So go a little past and see what happens, and then you can always dial it back. Uh so what is with your years of experience? What is your one tip when you have a new photographer, you're opening that mechanical camera, you're showing people photography and how it works. You get a, a, a somebody come in, they bring their child to you for, for medical care and, and you're talking to them and they go, by the way, I see all these pictures. I'm just getting started. What's your one tip? Well, I tell you, I do this all the time with adolescents uh, and I've actually helped some adolescents. One of them went into, is actually now a photojournalist. Uh, she, she took it all the way. But the one tip, and I don't have that book in front of me, is read one book. If you had to read one book, it's Learning to See Creatively by Brian Peterson. Um, I, I think it's, it's inexpensive. It's about, I don't know, $20 or so. But Brian teaches you how to look at things. Before you get to play around with the camera, you need to know how to see. You need to know how to go and look at a mailbox and say, okay, everybody else sees this mailbox. How can I make it look different? How can I see it in a different way where somebody will look at that image and go, wow, you just did that with a mailbox? Yeah. That to me is, is the essence of photography, is taking the ordinary and making it look extraordinary. Through capturing light and right. understanding light and shadow and understanding compositional techniques like you discussed earlier with understanding flow and relationships. Uh, yeah, really good tip. So Platypod, it's not only available in the US, it's available in Canada, I'm reading here, Canada, England, Japan, and Germany. Correct. Right, and they can get them all through the website, which I've, I've put up throughout this show, which is platypod.com. But you've got, I'm not asking you to, to spoil it, but okay. you do have some really cool stuff coming up in the future, right? 
I, I do have some really cool stuff coming up in the future. Um, we are going to revolutionize um, the uh, camera support industry. Um, I, I hope we already have with the Platypod itself. The next piece we're coming up with is, I think, going to be awesome. We spent three years research on it. We will have spent, I would say, somewhere in the order of $200,000 developing it. And uh, when it comes out on Kickstarter next year, I think it's going to just bowl people over. We've, we've showed it to some pros already, and I I think it'll be amazing. Yeah. And, and I just got to say, as a photographer, there, you know, I said in the intro, in photography, we see these new products in our space all the time. And sometimes it's like, oh, that's cool. Sometimes it's wow. Then you get it in your hands, right? The real test. And you go, yeah, it, it was much cooler on a website. Um, but now and then you get a photographer that just sees something that everybody missed. And usually the best ones are like this, where it's like, there's a hundred people that should have realized this needed to be done that didn't, right? And somebody sees it and makes it, and, and I'm not blowing air at you. Really, honestly, you've got a really neat product, really well done. Thank you very much. I have to give credit to one person, a classic photographer, Irving Penn. If you Google Irving Penn Platypod, okay. you will find... You will find an article coming up. You know, recently there was a uh, there was a traveling uh, photography show uh, showing Irving Penn's pictures. He used to do this amazing portraiture work. It, sometimes in third world countries, he'd set up a background and just bring people in and start taking uh, portrait photos of them. But Irving Penn actually machined a pig's round steel plate and put a few giant bolts in it and put his Rolleiflex uh, twin lens camera on it. Uh, it was the first platypod, but he ne he never marketed it and never mass produced it. But uh, that was in the museum and in this article. If you pull that up, you'll you'll find a picture of Irving Penn's version of the platypod. So, for everybody that gets a gift card for Christmas, this show is going to air right after the the New Year. So this is going to be my first show of 2019. And if you've got gift cards and you're looking for something to get, uh. I, I can't stress it enough. I've got them sitting right here next to me. Nobody can see my hand. They're sitting right there next to me. <laughs> and I just got to say, Larry, beautiful job. So there we go. Now we got it on camera. So Dr. T, Larry uh, uh, Tiefenbrunn. I'm going to get your name smooth where I can say it quickly. Tiefenbrunn, uh, thank you so much for being on the show, man. I can't say thanks enough. You're so welcome. And it's, again, such an honor to be here. And if I can leave with one last tip. You can leave with anything you want. <laughs> One last tip. This works best when you just leave it in your camera bag all the time with a small tripod head sitting in the corner. You're not going to use it for every picture, just your best ones. And it'll be there when you didn't think you needed a tripod because that's that's why I made it. Do that's me a favor. There. Grab that thing again because there's yes. something I want to mention that I think is also cool. So if you look at the top of that thing, it's got a big hole in the opening. And you stick a carabiner in there and you hang that on the outside of your backpack and just leave your ball head on it. Right. That's so when you're just doing a day hike and you're in Southern California and you're hiking up to see the Hollywood sign or something, you put a carabiner on that thing and you are and this, done. You've you just, got just everything hang, you need. And, and here's the other thing. I don't care if you're doing iPhone photography. Right. There are there are ball heads that have iPhone attachments or mobile phone. You know, OK, you have a Samsung, whatever. Um, Guess how I use my iPhone. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> there you go, Steve. Right there. There you go. Because oh. that's the first thing I thought of was this is the perfect thing. If you're like me, I went to France last year and I oh. and when I went to Vermont and Maine, I said to myself, you know what? I'm not going to take my full camera. I'm not going to be that guy. I'm just going to take my phone. Boom. Which which attachment do you have on that for your phone? The ones I love the best, made by Square Jellyfish. Um, they make one, this one's actually made for the iPad, but they make them for the iPhone for about 15 bucks with an aluminum attachment here. These will last you a long, long, long time. And it's time. got an Arca Swiss connection? And I, I, I actually mounted it. You can mount it on anything with a quarter 20 uh, bolt. Okay. I happen to put it on an Arca plate 
And uh, yeah, it works really nicely on that. See? But you can take any little arca plate and just stick it on there. They even, they even make them for like And 10, that's 12. where, to me, this thing shines, is you want to you want to just go to Europe, but you don't want to be the guy whose wife has to wait while you go, hang on, honey. And you're trying to f- decide what lens you're going to use. Take your phone, but take a platypod. And when you go in a church where they won't let you set up a tripod and you set up this thing, everyone is going to look at you like, I'm an idiot that I don't have that. That's kind of what it is. Just but nothing's like it for panos, Steve. I mean, when you. If you know if you're trying to do this, sometimes if your hand's not right. super steady, you don't get a great pano. You put it on here and just put it on a pano head. Boom, you cut yeah, just you cut that coming in beautifully smooth. I just did that in Shanghai, uh, at the Bund, uh, just overlooking the uh, the waterfront. Oh, god, that thing came out gorgeous! Yeah, wonderful. So, Larry, again, Dr. T, thank you so much for being here. I appreciate it. Everybody can check them out, it's at platypod.com, and I highly suggest that you do go check it out. I know I'm sounding a little overexcited about a product, but it, you know, now and then just a product comes along and when it does, you immediately know that's something that is going to change how people shoot. And that's kind of how I feel about this. So if you want to find me online, you can find me on Twitter and Instagram. It's at Steve Brazel. It's like the country of Brazil, but two L's or at behind the shot TV. If you want to find me on Facebook, that one's just as easy. It's on uh, Steve Brazel photography for me or the podcast is behind the shot podcast and my websites stevebrazel.com or behind the shot.tv make sure that you go to behind the shot.tv because the blog post associated with this episode i've got a gallery of larry's images up there some more image some more uh, info about larry and about platypod that you can read up on plus we've got that red river paper contest going on so head up there that goes to the end of january You can win yourself one of 10 sample packs for Red River paper and one person going to get a beautiful print of my guest on the December 6th episode. So go look at that episode if you want to see the photo. Uh, Carl Eric Voslog, beautiful shot, seaside in Norway. Someone's going to win that from Red River paper, 13 by 19 custom print. So to everybody, thanks very much. My name is Steve Brazel, your host. This is the podcast where we try and get inside the mind of great photographers by taking a closer look behind one of their shots. We'll see you next time.